The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. Okay, so we're not here, unfortunately, to talk about my cowboy outfit, which is pretty cool. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today was my assembly table. So much like, no, that was last week. <laughs> much like the assembly table talk, it, you know, I wanted to show you what was different about this particular version because it's really not all that different. I didn't think it was worth doing a whole nother video series on something that only had slight modifications from the version that's already available on the website. Um, so I kind of felt like I'd be spinning my wheels. So I quickly built it uh, to my specs and there's a few changes, so we'll talk about those. But for folks who are new, maybe you don't even know that the Outfeed Table project, I think it's called Somebody Feed Me. Uh, that particular project's been on the site for a while. It's a very basic table and it's more of, I mean, really it's just a random table. It just happens to be uh, used as an assembly, or I'm sorry, an Outfeed Table. I'm gonna keep saying that all day. This one, however, I made a few changes that I thought were a little bit more, uh, kind of committed it to being an outfeed table as opposed to just a big work surface that happens to be at the edge of the table saw. So let's go over a few of those, but first let's talk about, you know, what makes a good outfeed surface and why you need it in the first place. Now, if you've ever used a table saw, you probably already know why you need one of these things, right? Anytime you're putting long work pieces, and heck, even short work pieces, once you cut them, if you don't have something to support the work after the blade, you've got a potential hazard on your hands. Stuff can drop, large work pieces. Think about cutting a big old sheet of four by eight ply. You're pushing that through there. As soon as the bulk of the weight is off of the table, what's gonna happen? It's gonna flip up. So it's a real safety hazard if you don't have some sort of allowance for your outfeed, airplane, We'll take an airplane break, which is also known as an iced tea break. So you might be tempted to use something like this. This is a pretty standard outfeed roller. This is one that I got from Rockler. It's pretty heavy duty. Uh, it's got a nice top up here that can switch between the little uh, roller balls and then also the uh, sort of linear roller stand at the top. So depending on how you want to use it. And you raise it up or down, and it is okay, you know, it will work in terms of catching pieces as they come off of the table saw. Uh, but you do have issues sometimes where things can get caught between the rollers and you really only have one area of support. That's not ideal. You really want a full surface. So roller stands are okay. They certainly work in a pinch. And if you've got a portable setup, maybe you have to move things out of the garage every night, uh, if you're not, um, you know, if you have to make room for cars or whatever, sometimes the roller stands are all you're going to be able to use. You can even get some saw horses and throw a thin sheet of plywood on top and use that as a uh, work surface or an outfeed surface, which I actually would prefer because I don't like there to be any space because if there's space between the table and the outfeed table, or in this case, a roller stand, uh, if you have any space there, you're going to drop things down it. It's an opportunity for maybe a real thin workpiece. Maybe this was set at the right height or you thought it was until you get it to this point in the process, the thin workpiece starts to bend a little bit as they tend to do. And it winds up smacking right into the roller and you can't push it any further. Problem is you're on this side of the, uh, you know, the business end of the saw. And what are you supposed to do? You have to stop in the middle of the cut, try to stabilize the piece and then figure out your setup afterwards. So it just presents some dangers. So for me, the ideal, this is of course, if you have the space for it, the ideal outfeed table is something that is almost exactly the dimensions of my uh, table saw surface. So the whole thing almost repeated a second time over. Now, the way I like to measure this out is, you know, question is always how far do you need to go? Well, for me, I like to think about if I were pushing an eight foot long piece of material through here, how long would this surface need to be? So I measure behind the blade, most of the time if I'm pushing something through, by the time I'm right about here, I'm done. I'm safely cleared from the blade. There's no concerns with the blade. That's where I'm gonna let go. So the question is from that point, 
If I measure out eight feet, that's about here. I wanna make sure that more than half of that sheet, I wanna make sure that more than half of that sheet is on my support surface. So basically where this piece stops, I wanna make sure I've got at least four feet of support measuring from that workpiece. And frankly, that puts me right at the end of my table here. I didn't really want it to be any longer than it needed to be. If you're doing like a 10 foot piece, it you know, isn't really gonna work out as well, but how often are you gonna be ripping uh, 10 foot pieces? And if you do, you always have your roller stands to supplement what you've set up here for yourself. So that's how I measure out. So the dimensions of this top are roughly uh, just under, well, about 42 and a half. And then side to side really doesn't matter, just as long as, you know, go as far as you can afford to go. I've got mine that's about 57 and a half inches. Okay, so those dimensions are not, you know, in stone. They're not absolutely critical. The most critical dimension is, you know, that you are at least, I would say like at least four feet. To me, that's a comfortable number to go with. All right, uh, you know, I did also wanna mention in the past, and I'll be able to put some pictures up for this uh, later on when I edit this. Um, I had an outfeed table. This is something you should think about if you have a small amount of space. You don't just have two choices, this or a roller stand. You can do a folding outfeed table so that if you need to get that space back and you know, maybe park in the garage or something, you can actually have one that folds down. So I'll post some pictures of that. There's probably a ton of plans uh, on the internet for um, you know, outfeed tables that work that way. But the idea is you have a permanently fixed I don't know, maybe eight inches, eight to 12 inches long, basic uh, outfeed support, which will sa actually work for most operations. But when you need that little bit of extra support, you've got this hinged portion that you pull up, the legs fold down, and then now you have that extra support. But when you're not using it, fold it back up and you don't even know it's there. They also have, uh, who is it, HTC, makes a commercially available roller stand. Anyone who has watched Woodworks has probably seen David Marks used that. Uh, not my favorite thing, because again, we've got an issue where stuff can fall through. Um, it just is not, in my opinion, as good as something that uh, goes right across the surface and covers this entire area. One other thing I wanna point out is the height. What I like to do is I like to design mine so that my ultimate height is about a quarter inch under my table surface because at that point, I'm gonna use leg levelers. Doesn't matter what kind, maybe you're just gonna go low tech and just use some shims. Doesn't matter what you use, but give yourself about a quarter of an inch. And this way you can kind of just tap it up or use the leg levelers to bring it up to the level where the outfeed table is maybe about, mine is about a 32nd to a 16th below the surface of the table saw. You don't want it any higher because pieces will come across and tap right into it, that would be dangerous. So at least this way, if it's just a hair under the surface level of the table saw, it's gonna be perfect and you won't ever have anything catch on it. Uh, and those leg levelers help you really dial it in to make sure that it's perfect. All right, I want to also show you, let me bring the camera around here. Now most table saws, or at least you know, your, your cabinet style saws, uh, they will have this L bracket at the front end here. And that's sort of something you can use to support your top if you need to. Now, my top is completely supported, so I don't even, I've got a little bit of space here between my L bracket and the tabletop itself. You could fill that with some sort of strips or something like that, but I just didn't feel it was necessary. But the point is, what this allows me to do is to get up as far and as close to the table saw as possible, all right? And that's what I've got here. Ultimately, when it's all said and done, I have bolts that are in the way so I can only go so far in, I've got about a half inch gap between the table and the outfeed. That's not too bad, yeah? I'm pretty happy with that. Certainly can't complain. Okay, so the other thing, let's talk about, this is one of the things that makes this system different than my previous outfeed table, which again, like I said, was really just kind of a, a generic work surface, are the grooves, all right? Whenever you are using a cross-cut sled, Maybe you're using a miter gauge. As you know, when you push through, you eventually get to a point where the bar, the miter bar, has to go somewhere. So what are you gonna do? Well, you need to have something, well, you know what? I haven't used this. <laughs> this is great. Uh, you see the little um, catch on here that prevents this from going all over the place. Watch what happens. 
I didn't allow for that. So I'm actually a little bit too tight. The cool thing is this is just routed with a straight bit. So obviously this is very new. I haven't confronted that problem yet. But my point is as you push something through the blade, a lot of times you wanna go all the way through and you need to be able to push further than this surface will normally allow. So you've got to route a slot there for yourself. Uh, in fact, when I did this, I'm pretty sure I set this up based on my, um, uh, my cross cut sled, which would probably explain why it's not working. But now I'm curious, so bear with me. Yeah, so when I set it up, I was only accounting for the sleds on my cross cut, or the uh, runners on my cross cut sled, and I didn't even think about my miter gauge. So I'll have to, have to make some adjustments there. But you can see now, I can go all the way through the cut with no problem, all right? If I didn't have those grooves there, I wouldn't be able to do this because the tabletop itself would have stopped my runners from making you know, the full travel. So just to give you an idea of the materials, the construction is really, really simple here. This is exactly the same as it was in the Somebody Feed Me video. I'm just using strips of plywood. Uh, there is a rabbit on one side. It's nailed in to create this L bracket. Uh, these pieces are sort of decorative on the outside here. There's an inner strip that runs across and gets glued and screwed to this face. On the inside, that creates the support. Got a nice bottom shelf. Uh, the top, pretty straightforward too. And this is just a double sandwich of three quarter inch birch ply with an MDF strip on the outside. Why MDF? Um, because I had it and I was being lazy. That really should probably be some kind of a hardwood, but I'm crazy like that. I do crazy things. Uh, basically, I just glued the two layers of birch ply together and had these nice little MDF strips. I figured what the heck, let me use them. Um, went around the entire outside, helps to firm things up a little bit, trims it out real nice. So now I've got all this uh, storage space below that I could use for whatever table saw accessories I need to keep around. And it works out real well. So again, the construction, if you go and look at the old video, you'll pretty much see how the base went together. Um, there's really no great mysteries there. And in fact, if I remember correctly, that was one that the L bracket leg design uh, was inspired from uh, the New Yankee workshop. I think Norm built what he was calling his assembly table, and I thought it was just a really good, very quick way to build a table surface. I said, I'm gonna borrow that. Thank you, Norm. You're the best. All right, so that is, uh, that's the assembly. Oh, why do I keep saying that? That's the outfeed table. Bottom line though with this assembly table stuff is it really doesn't matter uh, what you use if you're at least using something. Uh, something's better than nothing. A lot of people may need to really conserve space, so one thing you could think about is if you like the idea of an assembly table, it certainly is possible to bring that assembly table over here. Your assembly table is now your outfeed space. Um, if you have the room, it's nice to you know, have separate tables for these things, because I don't know about you, but anytime I have a horizontal surface, I nearly always put crap on it. I don't know what my problem is, but it's like, you know, I don't know. It's like a moth to a flame. I have to do it. So the more horizontal spaces I have, the better, because I can let crap accumulate over there instead of here. And if crap accumulates here, it's in my way when I'm about to do something, um, when I need to run a piece through. So it's not uh, really not a great idea. Um, but yeah, yeah, like I said, something is better than nothing. Some outfeed support is really gonna boost the safety in your shop and make it a lot easier to work alone, you know, for, with larger pieces of material. You know, you've also got the possibility of, um, I've seen people who use this space with a, an MFT in the old setup at the house. In fact, I had a, a Festool multifunction table that served as my outfeed table. So that was a dual use. Um, you could set up some sort of a router table uh, set up over there. You could have, um, uh, what else? You could have a workbench there if you were so inclined. You know, so if you're really tight on space, that's the kind of thing you want to think about. Any good projects going on? Well, we have a really good project coming up. I haven't, I think I've really made an official announcement. Oh, you know what? I, I mentioned at the, at the end of the rocking horse build. 
is the uh, Rubo split top workbench in the guild. I made the announcement in the guild, but I didn't make it you know, publicly on the Wood Whisper site. So that is the next project in the shop. So I got to pick up a bunch of soft maple and start making a very big, heavy, and beautiful workbench. A uh, good question on the finish. Um, for your outfeed table finish, ultimately, just honestly, whatever you have in the shop that you need to get rid of, I think you should go with a film finish because I do like the surface to be nice and slippery. So if you have shellac, polyurethane, uh, I would say poly is probably the easiest, cheapest, best option just because it's really durable, uh, goes on quickly, dries fairly fast, and you don't really have to think about it very much if you spill stain or something on it, if you are using it as a, a, a dual purpose surface. But honestly, the surface is not that picky. The only thing I would recommend you do is make it slippery. So if you are using shellac, you know, once you have that final coat on, maybe get some 2000 grit paper, just give it a nice rub down and a coat of wax. That's all you need to do. What I used was a water-based finish. I just had a couple of cans that have been sitting around far too long. It was time to use them up, sprayed it, and gave it like three coats, and that's it. And this is super slippery. So as long as stuff has no friction, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Would I recommend the Rubo as a first bench? Um, I, recommend, I recommend the Rubo as your only bench. I don't think it will be your first. I think it will, well, it'll be your first and your last. The question is, are you ready to build it? I think anybody with, you know, who, who has the right tools to do the job is certainly capable of building that bench, but it will probably be the very last bench you ever build. So I made the mistake of building a bench well before I really knew what I needed out of a bench. So the end result was something that didn't really suit my needs. Uh, Arubo, on the other hand, is a, a lot better thought out than my bench was. Um, there are woodworkers everywhere who are building this thing and loving it. And, you know, these are people who are even hardcore hand tool users who adore this bench design. So I have no, uh, you know, reservations about whether or not the design will stand the test of time, which is a lot of times the mistake you make when you jump into making a workbench before you should. You know, maybe you're just starting out and you just don't know what type of work you want to do. So I find the Rubo to be a very flexible design. It satisfies needs for both uh, power tool woodworkers and hand tool woodworkers, and it can be easily upgraded to do just about anything you need it to do. So if you feel that you're comfortable jumping into that particular type of bench, I do recommend that as your first bench because I recommend trying to avoid having to build a second bench ever. Because if you don't have to, why not, you know, let's get it right the first time. Uh, sharp iron, low angle, what can you do to make planing end grain easier? Uh, maybe moisten the end grain a little bit, hit it with a little bit of alcohol. Uh, that tends to soften the fibers. There are times when my plane, like you know, my block plane for instance, I know it's dead sharp uh, because I just sharpened it. And I've got everything you know, lubricated, some wax on the sole, and I'm trying, and I sort of just get that kind of friction noise that you get on end grain sometimes, and I'm only making dust or little small ribbons. But if I put a little alcohol on the surface, suddenly I get full length shavings off of it. It depends on what species you're working on too and how temperamental it is. Uh, but I find that if you moisten it with a little bit of alcohol, um, you'll be pretty impressed at how different the wood behaves when you're planing end grain. Would I feel comfortable putting a router into this surface? In terms of um, stability, yes. This is two layers of Baltic birch. If it has enough support so that there's no chance of sagging, I'd have no problem putting a router in here. But again, that's a lot of weight, so you wanna make sure there's no opportunity to sag. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. Functionally speaking, as someone who just lived recently with a router table in his outfeed area, I can tell you it's kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, you know, necessity is the, the mother of invention. So if you have to do it, that's one thing. If you don't have to do it, I would really recommend building a router table and having it be a standalone thing. Part of the reason is because when I'm doing a routing operation, it's like, what happens when I need to use the table saw? You know, so my router fence would be in the way, but I had something set up. So now I have to screw up my router table setup just to make another cut at the table saw. Um, the more things you have in one area, the more uh, chance you have of ruining a setup because you need to use the other tool. So, so it can be done and there's nothing wrong with it structurally to be fine, but I'm just not sure um, I would want to do that if I had a choice. Planer, sander, miter saw, router table. You know what, when someone gives me a list of tools and they say, what tool do I buy next? Uh, usually my stock answer is, you tell me. 
Um, because what I recommend you do is you get into your shop and you start making something. Once you start building something and you find a huge gap and you say, I can't get any further without this thing, or I need to do something to make this happen, what tool satisfies that need? Then you're doing it what I consider the right way. Because if you're just kind of assembling tools based on theory and what you think might be right, that's a good way to wind up with stuff you don't use. Um, and I've done that, and that's why I can kind of confidently say this. But if you are building and trying to make things and then you hit obstacles, and you go, you know what, I can't get any further in this project until I buy myself a decent set of chisels. Now you know, you satisfied the need and you have the chisels and now you can move on with your project. Um, but if you're just, you know, if you're just trying to sort of assemble things ahead of time, you can do it. I mean, you could look around my shop and see everything that I have or look at the shop tours uh, section of the website and see what hundreds of other woodworkers are doing and just model what they're doing and you'll probably be in the ballpark, but you'll probably also have stuff that you never use. So you might wind up wasting money that way. Uh, John, you know what? Um, there was a bench, and I, I'd be surprised if you didn't see it. Wasn't it fine woodworking that produced a plan for a bench that relied solely on uh, pipe clamps? I mean, it, to me, it looked a little rickety, but it certainly served the, the purpose. Um, so yeah, I mean, technically, yes, if you're in a pinch, you know, again, that whole necessity thing, right? If you're in a pinch, you could certainly use those and talk about cost effective, very cheap. Yeah, you know, to be honest, I think the risk we run with a lot of this, you know, the boutique level tools, and I've been talking to a lot of the bloggers and stuff about this. We'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow. Uh, we're gonna do a uh, Wood Talk Online is gonna be back in session. Uh, but one of the topics we're going to talk about a little bit is the whole sort of boutiquiness uh, of hand tools, uh, you know, and how, I don't know, to me, we used to really think of power tools as the place of excess, the place where people buy more horsepower than they need. They buy a bigger table saw than they need uh, just because power tools have always been, you know, um, you know, like Tim the Tool Man Taylor, more power. Uh, but it also seems like now the world of hand tools is following a very similar path and you don't have to go too far, no further than the Woodworking in America marketplace floor to see that in action, to see that Lee Valley and Lee Nielsen are now considered the low end of the spectrum is hilarious to me. Um, so, so it's very interesting. It's something to, to keep your eye on. And you know, the bench crafted hardware is another good example. Uh, there are lots of low-tech ways to, to hold work to a bench. You know, we've been doing it for centuries. Um, but there is something about their hardware, and I, I'm, I fall victim to it too. This is not a finger-pointing thing because I'd be pointing it at myself. I'm guilty of that in power tools and hand tools. I like bigger, sharper, shinier, better built. I mean, that stuff is, is just, I think, attractive to a lot of us. So I fall victim to it too. And, um, you know, the reality is it's probably more than we need, you know? It's probably better milled than it needs to be. Um, but we're talking about a hobby here for most of us. And if we were just doing things based on what we absolutely need, I think our shops would all look very different than they do. But that's how hobbies work, you know? Any hobby tends to work that way. Most people in hobbies do not get by on what they absolutely need. They usually get by on what they can afford. I just think it's interesting to also see this occurring in the world of hand tools now. So, all right, I'm gonna hang out for just a couple minutes to chat with you guys a little bit, but as far as the uh, recording goes, I'm gonna close it off here. Bottom line, assembly tables are, uh, that's like the fifth time I did that. Outfeed tables are awesome and uh, highly recommend, uh, if only for safety and convenience, you, you look into some sort of a secure outfeed surface. It's, it's definitely gonna up your game a little bit in the shop, so. Um, thanks to everybody for coming by live and hopefully the recorded version of this will be out uh, within a day or two. So thanks for watching y'all.